Well, bless you. Are you well this morning? Come on. How could you not be after that, huh? Well, we want to just welcome all of you here. Greetings from Connecticut. How many been to Connecticut? Just a few. All right. Well, that's all right. And can we give a hand to everybody watching live stream? Believe it or not, people are tuning in. Come on. Let's give them a hand. Come on, friends. Let's be friendly. We got a lot of our folks back home watching, so just want to just say such an honor to be here. Um, I know I said it before, but we truly, uh, it's like home to a degree, you know, and we just love, love, love your pastors. Aren't they such a blessing to you? Come on. I'm not just saying that. My wife and I have the privilege of traveling almost weekly, and uh, they're just some of the best on the planet, so you're really blessed, and uh, I really believe that God is preparing you for such a, you know, the Bible talks about when you're on a pilgrimage, the, the blessing that comes with that. And how many know you're on a pilgrimage? God's put you on this property to see this city shaken, to see this region just blasted by God. And, and continually in a day where Christianity is, is uh, you know, the enemy just so desires to water down the message of the gospel. <laughs> how many know you don't get water? <laughs> And uh, you guys are blessed here uh, to be in a church that we really look up to, that's filled with the Holy Ghost, that one of the greatest teachers on the planet, honestly, and uh, in the greatest families we know. So just know that you're in a place where, where God is preparing you for something greater. Do you believe it? Yeah. You know, the Bible, I think I've said it before, but it's interesting that the Bible says that Jesus breathed on the disciples. And right after that, he said, receive the Holy Ghost kind of weird that he clarified, but I really believe that it's possible for God to breathe and you not receive. And subsequently, you could be in a meeting like this, hear the word of God so strong every single week and still not be changed by it. And so I want to exhort you, encourage you, and kind of challenge you that you've got to get everything you can. This place is filled with destiny and hope, and the meat that is coming forth from the word of God is just to life change you. I promise you. And, and, and it continually lifts the standard uh, for how we should be living. Amen? Um, but with that said, so exciting to be here. Many of you don't know my beautiful wife. Everybody say, hi, Debbie. Debbie, can you stand? Wave to everyone. It's my Canadian princess. Uh, a lot of people may not know, but my wife uh, almost moved here, believe it or not. And uh, it, was, it was very much a part of her dream and her life to be in America, and uh, she was, was packed up at the border, ready to come here on a visa, and she got denied at the border. Uh, not because she's a terrorist, <laughs> but uh, just that God had other plans. Come on, somebody. Thank God she didn't come here. But uh, uh, God brought her in the front door. Come on. But uh, we, 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 we love, have a beautiful life together, and we pastor a church in Connecticut called Engaging Heaven Church. And the Lord re really just, uh, similar to the building, you guys are really in the process of seeing God just redeem this land. Uh, we were given about two years ago a building, 750-seat sanctuary, uh, just, I mean, a building like you just wouldn't see out here, but uh, just that was used during the Great Awakening. So like George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, David Brainerd, some of the greatest missionaries on the planet ministered in our pulpit, man. It's pretty crazy. So it's this massive, like, kind of crazy building you would only see in, like, London, sitting in the middle of, you know, New London, Connecticut, and it was the first church ever established in our city. So what would happen is God would break out, they would build a church, and then the community was built around it. Pretty fascinating thing, but we're actually in the process of purchasing the building. So, uh, you know, we, our leaders know, if the church is watching, there you go, but, uh, we're in the process of buying the building, and we really believe that it's a sign. You know, it's not about the, the physical building that we're in, but it's really what God has. Amen? Right. And there's destiny connected to California. It so moves me when I come here because you just feel the greatness that God has for this land, the moves that God did in the past, the denominations that were the movements that were birthed here. And similar to New England, it's just something about this land that God has kissed. And, you know, you can drive by areas that had miracle meetings in it and just be just callous to it. And the truth is that God is still, you know, the Bible says that the Lord hovers over his word ready to perform it. The problem is we don't, right? <laughs> but we've got to look from God's perspective and begin to see it. It's about living from that throne room life. 
that we can begin to see what God wants to do and live from that dimension. Are you with me? And so you're, you're primed and prepared for what I believe is the greatest awakening the world has ever seen. These oceans weren't made for surfing, friends. They were made for baptisms. This land, I'm I promise you, you may, you'll thank me one day and remember, but that's what they were made for. God designed this land that it would see God's move on the earth. And, and right now, you know, there's something about eternity that burns within us. And, and when we're living every day in light of eternity, it changes the way we live. You, you can't listen to Pastor Mark preach without hearing the kingdom. You can't talk to him, dude, without hearing the word the kingdom about eight times in a sentence. You just like, it's just like one big kingdom, but you realize that he just desires and chooses to live in another realm. But I don't believe that was just one man or woman that was called to live and dwell there. Are you with me? But there's something that happens in our lives when we learn to live in light of eternity. The truth is, one day, we're not going to be a part of this world. We're not even going to be passing through. We're going to be with whole bodies. There'll be no tear. We'll be in a place that is the most magnificent place on the earth. And unfortunately, like Catherine Coleman said on her deathbed, one of the greatest disappointments will probably be when we get to heaven. And we look back in this wonderful place we call heaven and realize how much of it we really could have had on earth. So there's something about learning to live in another dimension where God begins to say, I'm actually calling you to live here. I want you now not to wait. Heaven isn't just, you know, you know the Holy Spirit's not a bird, and heaven isn't just a place that, that we're just ho holding on to to get to one day if we just don't sin enough. That the truth is, if we were in line today for the judgment seat, and every single one of us were standing in line ready to meet the Lord, I'm going to tell you right now, the things that you value on earth wouldn't matter. If we're standing in line to the judgment seat, you're not going to worry about how somebody perceived you online. You're not going to worry about if your bills got paid. It's not going to matter what your uncle did to you when you were eight years old, although you needed to forgive him. When you're standing in line at the judgment seat, can you imagine, although it's not God's desire, the masses that wouldn't make it? And if so, somehow the conversation could be said and they'd look at you and, and, and knowing on earth, and it might have been in 1979, and it might have been in a moment where, you know, God touched you at a youth gathering, and it might even have been at this church, but you made a decision to receive this thing we call salvation. Which can I please tell you, you don't have a clue what this is really about, to be honest with you. It's not just about getting your sins forgiven and making it in. Friends, that's the last of the concern in heaven. He gave you a deposit to make it into glory that we wouldn't, uh, you know, that we wouldn't be tormented by fire or in hell. But there was so much more given with this gift. And this gift in it contains a life, and not just a life, but it more abundantly. And this gift contains a destiny connected to it that you were created for a greater life than what you see right now. In this gift was connected the full ability to see from another dimension. That's why there's scriptures that we don't fully get that say we're seated in another place. Yeah. There's scriptures that say we've been given everything we need to live the life in godliness. And so somehow we look at this and it's just been reduced to something we cling on to when we mess up. Yeah. Yeah. We call this good preaching on the East Coast. I'm just telling you just really quickly. So if you're sitting in light of the judgment seat on that day, if it was this morning, and all of a sudden, you know it doesn't matter? The people around you that peer pressure you to live a watered-down life. Because all of a sudden, what you have in your hand matters. And all of a sudden, you realize the value of what we were given down on this earth. And if anybody came to you and said, can you please, I'll buy that from you. I promise I have a million dollars that was hidden in one of these weird hills around here. And can I give it to you? You wouldn't sell it. If somebody came to you and started cursing you in the face and beat you down for it, you wouldn't let go. It wouldn't matter then, but it's somehow here we're so attached. But when we learn to live in light of eternity, everything changes. And when you meet people that live there, it, they just don't fit. Yeah. Pastor Mark doesn't fit, dude. He doesn't fit. He doesn't fit. They just, but they don't want to, we're not called to fit. We're called to live in a different dimension and realize that if this was given to us, then we must maximize everything that was been given. 
If there's peace that surpasses understanding, then be willing to not understand. If there's peace that we may not ever even imagine. You know, the Lord said to me recently, he said, I want you, I'm going to bring you into a place to where you begin to trust without your own understanding. Wowzer. We all want to trust with our own, it's like a paralysis by analysis. We want to trust with our own understanding. We want to figure it out because that's what we're all used to doing here on this earth, but not in heaven. And this is a gift. Jesus said, peace I give to you. Peace isn't the absence of conflict. He said, peace I give you. He said, not as the world gives you. Well, all those people in line wanting what you have, they don't get what you get. Or did you get it? Because peace is a gift given to those that serve the Lord. See, I've realized in a short amount of time in ministry, there's a difference between being saved and seeing Jesus. If you're just trying to get in, dude, good luck. But if you want to encounter him and see him for who he really is and see all the scales that this world tries to put on your face, see, unfortunately, this land groans. It groans of what God did in the past. It groans of what he wants to do in the future. And many people just live Christian callous to the whole thing. While the enemy, the Bible says in Luke 11, finds a place that the Lord has blessed. I know you can handle it, so I'm going to just spoon feed you, okay? I know who you listen to every week. The dude gags me, so I'm just, I'm going to swing this bat every which way up but upside your head. I know who I'm talking to this morning. So in Luke 11, it says that when the, when the house is cleaned out, if we're not careful, the enemy tries to come in seven times greater. So the same way when God breathes on a land like he did in this region, the enemy would want nothing more than to come into that land and make it a mockery of what it used to be. If you drive down our streets, I remember being born again. I didn't know anything. I didn't know about the Wesleys. I didn't know about denominations. And, and you can drive down my little, sit, my little coastal town, nowhere near as big as this region and, and there was a building that had a cross and a flame on it man I thought dude it said Methodist and I thought you got to be kidding me if the, if I ever could buy a logo dude I want the cross and the flame like you win you know what I'm saying but unfortunately they're still ordaining homosexuals what in the world would Wesley think today why because the enemy sees what God used to do and he sought after one generation paid the price they broke through for a whole generation. The deliverers rise up. They break through. Everybody comes into this greater understanding of the kingdom. Only to see a generation die off. The baton never gets picked up to the same sacrifice or love or degree. And then generations after generations wander. And the enemy wants the latter point to be worse than the beginning. It's not going to happen. We know the end. But I promise you that's what he wants to do. He doesn't need you to fall into the big things. If he can just get Christianity in California to live way underneath where it was called to be, he won. Because every single demon in hell trembles at you. They're scared of what you've been given. They're scared of the DNA that's been embedded inside of you. They know. Satan knows what this is. You don't. He knows. Please. Bible says one day we're going to look at him and say, that was you? You were the one that did this? That's a joke. You've been given a power, the Bible says in Hebrews, over the works of his hands. You, under your feet, everything will tremble because of him that lives in you. So John 17 comes to light when there's a oneness that I believe the church is about to see. Jesus wasn't praying for a kumbaya celebration. Friends, he said, I pray for those that you've given me and those that will be touched through my name. And he said that they would be one as you and I are one. I'm in you, you and me, that they would be in us. What is he talking about? Friends, if you've been given any more, you'd be a threat to the Trinity. It's a oneness with God that, friends, that we've just got to rise to and understand the places that we were seated. Turn with me in your Bibles quickly to John chapter 3. This morning, we're going to understand about living from the throne. And I'm, I'm going to give you, you know, big kid food because I know you can handle it. But I'm also going to, the Lord's going to release a, a gift of hope this morning. So just follow me on the thread. John 3, if you got it, say I got it. He's talking to Nicodemus and he says in verse 12, If I told you earthly things and you don't believe, how in the world are you going to believe if I tell you heavenly things? 
Nicodemus is wondering how to be born again. He's just trying to figure this out. Do I crawl back in? What is really going on? Can I tell you, we've got to see God everywhere on this earth. If we can't interpret the times and the seasons we live in, then how are we going to interpret the supernatural things? If, we, if you move, you know, when I got born again, I became so sensitive to what the Holy Spirit wanted to do. Whether I found myself in a movie or outside, everything began to speak to me like a message. I began to see God in everything around me because I was training my, my spirit man to see him everywhere he is. I was training him to look for him in the earthly things so that I would begin to receive him in the spiritual things. And Jesus said, listen, if you don't even get it here, there's parallels between both worlds. If you don't get it here, then how in the world are you going to get it when I really release stuff for you? It's the beauty of the teaching you get in Revelation, the fact that the Lord is giving your pastor an ability to see both realms in such a dramatic way. To look at the book of Revelation and see earthly parallels, but yet the spiritual revelation of what God says, it's astounding. But we've got to see that way. We've got to look at God on this earth and begin to receive him in that other realm. That's just the beginning because then he gets a little crazy. He says this, nobody that has ascended to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, that is the son of man that is in heaven. What? If I told you earthly things you don't believe then how are you going to believe if I tell you heavenly things? Nobody that has ascended to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man that's in he heaven. Jesus said nobody has ascended to heaven. If we ascended, where do we begin? If I told you I'm ascending in a moment, where am I starting? Do the math. If I'm going up, then where do I start? You're here. Right. Bible says that, that Jacob rested his head on a rock and a ladder was established from earth to heaven. See, there's something that triggers heaven on this realm that you're belonging in. Jesus said, I see the son of uh, uh, angels ascending and then descending upon the son of man. I believe he was talking to Nathaniel. What is he saying? There's something that is initiated from this realm that we've got to understand. Jesus said, listen, nobody that has ascended to heaven. And then he said, which was already in heaven. No, then he said, it's the son of man who is already in heaven now. He's talking about himself. But Jesus is telling you as he's on earth that he's not even here. What? He's telling you nobody is ascended which come to the Father, which is the Son of Man that is already in heaven. By the way, I'm talking to you on earth. Then which is it? It's both. It's the throne room life that you're called to live. Jesus Christ was, see, he wasn't just supposed to be this unreachable character that we can never attain. I believe he was sent to earth to show you the way to live. I believe he was sent to earth now greater to live inside of you that we would begin to look at his life because what he said to them was everything I do you'll do but greater things than these what were these the things he did that's when you get the John 10 10 life but then a greater realm of life what you think Christianity offers but then this greater realm that he wants you to step into he's telling you he's here but he's also there He's in both places at the very same time. Now we begin to open our eyes to the fact that you're seated in another place. As we're in this meeting now, you're still seated. You have the opportunity to see from another dimension. He's in both places at the very same time. The very idea of which we're supposed to live as believers. Which is it, bro? Are you here or are you there? I'm both. Oh, Jesus. I'm both. As I'm talking to you right now, I'm both. I'm in this realm just passing through with a purpose. And it's not just to make a paycheck from a work that I don't do anything to affect the kingdom. Kingdom was always first. It's not, it's not the first thing we run to when tragic comes. When you're living and seek ye first, it's, not, it's first always on the list. It's what I live for. Everything else doesn't matter. If I work my job, then my job is serving to confirm my kingdom destiny. It, whatever I do in life is in light of that there's a greater reason I was put on this earth and I matter to God. That I have a purpose and it's not limited to a microphone and a keyboard that is so 80s, bro. It's so ridiculous that this city needs to be rocked with kingdom dwellers that are living in two dimensions. That this region needs to be filled with people that are always conscious of eternity, always conscious of heaven on earth 
always conscious of God. Let your will be done on earth right now in this torn down place as it already is in heaven, as it already has been established, as it has already been precedented, that we are the agents of deliverance to bring that down here now. Turn to your neighbor and tell him you live in two realms. You live. You're not even here. Let me tell you. You might think some of you are always out to lunch, but you're just not out to the right lunch. He's in both places at the very same time. Ephesians 2.6 says this, that we were raised together with Christ. I really believe that when the resurrection took place, that is when we began to be seated with him. It says, basically it says his resurrection was yours. When he was raised from the dead, we were seated together with Christ in the resurrection. So at that moment, God says, I'm giving you a different view. I'm giving you uh, an ability to go to a, a leased apartment in heaven that you already own that you can go to any time. Problem is, some of you need to move in there. Colossians 3.1 says, if we were raised then, then we've got to set our minds now. It's about, it's about training our mind. God will take the minds of yielded believers and put his mark on it. When we say yes, God can say, okay, now I can do something. And our yeses has always got to be bigger than our noes. I began to believe to this morning that I just began to see this anointing of hope. You know, as I, as I, as I almost borderline lament on a land that God just wants to break forth in. As I think of the journey that this beautiful church is on, that God has is, is, is positioned you here to see a whole city shaken. That there's something about, you know, there's something about the times and seasons in God that we cannot lose heart in what God's trying to tell us to do. And it's not enough to just listen to amazing preaching. Are you with me? You know, we, we have a fireworks show once a year in uh, Connecticut, and people will tell you that, oh, you know, it's like one of the best in the world and they do the fireworks of whatever and they're award-winning and they do the olympics or whatever so basically we live in a loft kind of well near a gay bar in the inner city but there's a loft overlooking the ocean and we have some friends come up for the fireworks you know and it's like you come you watch great event and then everybody leaves friends i can't even tell you what the fireworks look like anymore and unfortunately it's not enough to come here and just see what you think is fireworks it's not going to be enough to change you We've got to receive the DNA of heaven to where we become like Jesus because as he is, so are we in this world. That just as Jesus is now, now we begin to operate in this earth. Turn me to 1 Kings chapter 18. I want to release this word of hope and then really just minister to you this morning because I really believe that God is releasing an anointing of hope. 1 Kings 18, if you got it, say got it. It's a really interesting chapter because 1 Kings 17, 1 says that there was a famine in the land. Basically, there was a drought. And the Lord says, "Woo!" the Lord says to Elisha, I'm going to end the drought. Well, let me tell you, that's a promise. And then the Lord says to him, go hide yourself. <laughs> that ain't the word I want to hear. So for three years, imagine the Lord speaking to you, I'm going to end the drought. You're like, oh, come on. What's the next word you want to tell me, Lord? Go hide yourself. That stinks. For three years? Like, did you get the word wrong? And then in, in, in 1 Kings 18, 1, he finally comes and he goes, now go reveal yourself. The problem is we want the revealing without the hiding. We want the drought to end without the hiding. I got to tell you, it still is about the secret place, saints. See, Jesus, I taught the church this last week. He's talking about prayer, and he basically says, listen, if you're going to pray out loud and you just want other men to see you, then you'll get your reward. What would that mean? He meant that is your reward. If all I want to do is be seen by men, then you could cash your check. And it's done, and we forgot about you. But if you really want to be effective, then go to the secret place where the Father is. We don't want to talk about where he really is. We want it to be here. 
where we just can, our flesh can be appreciated. We want to sing loud enough so the band notice us. We want to, you know, prophesy in the parking lot and seem anointed. Friends, that's a joke. The truth is, if you get favor with God in that secret place, then he'll reward you publicly. It's kind of a crazy oxymoron to a degree because Jesus tells you don't. It's weird because he just got this whole Matthew 4, 5, 6. He just got done saying if you pray out loud and you want to be noticed by others, that's all you're going to get. But if you really want to be effective, go into the secret place, pray. The Father will answer your prayers, and he'll, he'll, he'll basically give you everything again. So you'll, you'll still be honored in the public. So it's almost like saying, if you're going after this, then that's all you're going to get. But if you seek me, you'll get it all. It's like Peter when he said, who can be saved? Lord, we left everything to follow you. Then Jesus says this crazy thing. He's like, yes, you have. And I'm going to tell you, everybody that's left everything and followed me will receive all the riches in this lifetime now and the one to come. Yeah. What? When he's our everything, then you'll get it all. Because there's no attachment. Do you follow what I'm saying? There's no attachment to people. I mean, this, this is just a, such a byproduct of what ministry really is. Ministry is who you are when nobody's looking. Yeah. The fact that I pull people out of wheelchairs long before I was on a platform. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'll do it long after platforms and crowds leave. Amen. That's ministry. I, I've never in my life, and I'm not against people that do. I'm sure your pastor can study for 800 hours. I mean, I literally tried to open the Bible with him and he's reading in Greek and Hebrew. I just, I mean, that's foreign to me. My ears start steaming. But the, I, no, I, are you kidding me? This is life changing. But the idea for me to just study to get a message is so absurd. Because for me, it's just an overflow of who I am and who Jesus is in me. I'm a student of the word. I love the Holy Ghost. I don't have to agonize over what to preach. That's such a joke. If you're an, if you're an intimate, no, people teach this stuff in school, and it's like, then who are we pre-producing? If you're in connection with the Holy Spirit, then he'll always speak to you. It's like a tool belt. And if you're in fellowship with the Father and in constant communion, then you don't have to, you'll, listen, if God calls, if God gives you a message, you'll never need an invitation to preach. That's right. yeah. Because you'll begin to see God's opportunity in everything around you. And you begin to understand that this is your DNA to hear the word like Pastor Mark and others and like Jesus taught it. And it's our DNA to step into those greater things. You know, I remember just recently we had the honor of being with your pastors in Washington, D.C., you know, and it's like these moments in my life where, you know, you're just in these room with greatness, you know what I mean? And you're just like, dude, like God just, know, you know, Joel Stockstill's coming here. I mean, what an honor. And if you realize the miracle that man is and the power and the influence God has given this dude, I mean, had the largest youth group in all of America with over 10,000 kids and from a great church and it's similar to this family from a great family of preachers and just the fires all over this guy so i'm in the room with all these dudes you know and i just like soak it up and here they are just you know your pastor and joel just going back and forth just about faith and miracles and i'm sitting here man there's just moments in time we're in a huddled corner and my heart is just inscribing everything that these guys are saying right i mean you just you could take your pastor for granted that we're not and I'm just listening to the words that are coming out of these dudes' mouth. And they were talking about baby Anna and the miracle that God did and the stuff that Joel is believing for and the stuff he's seen. And they're just having conversation about faith. And all of a sudden, Pastor Mark, you probably don't even remember, remember you said this, but he just, they're quickly in a conversation. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. I mean, just like, let's not forget this moment. And he says, the problem is people are so attached to this world. And man, something went off in my head. And because we're, we're, we, when problems come and situations arise and the doctor says there's no hope and your job says it's your last week and, you know, all these things begin to happen. Somebody's messing with my mic. Let's put it back. And all these things begin to happen. We're so attached to this earthly realm. It's, it's probably why in the book of Acts, Jesus cleans the room out before he raises the dead. You know, I'm not talking about religion, like, oh, you don't have enough faith, get out the room. It makes sense, though, because we're so attached to earth, so emotionally attached to relationships and that we can't even deattach to see a miracle. And it just dawned on me about this whole living from the throne that that we, we can't just expect when crisis comes to somehow generate faith that we don't normally believe. Are you with me, Chair? We can't, 
We can't wait for a divorce or abuse or uh, our children to go through horrific situations to somehow drum up faith like an Aladdin genie. And I'm sure God's grace can help you there. I don't want to chance it and risk that dice. I want to learn to live in the realm of faith so when the doctor says the baby's going to die, I know without a doubt the baby's not going to die. I want to live in a realm of faith where I'm so disattached from the things that you value on this earth because they really mean nothing. Really means nothing. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy. You have treasure. Where are we placing our value system? Is it in a home? Because if the home is taken from you, you've lost. Paul on his deathbed says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is to gain. What is he talking about? If we live for the things of this world, when they get taken, then we've lost. If we live for the pleasure of our flesh, then when that's taken from us, we've lost. If we live for our jobs, then if it's taken, then we lost. But if we live for Christ, then death is a promotion. It's so twisted. This whole city is scared of death. Nobody wants to die. But Paul says, if I'm living for Christ, then it's actually a promotion. What? But what about the people? What about your life? What about your bank account? What about, it's just, who cares? It's a tool. See, young people and elderly people concern me. When you look at life, I mean, I definitely don't. I'm not like gonna give you wisdom on life. I'm gonna preach like I'm 80, but I'm really 34. But at the end of the day, I, in all my years, I see young people with the whole world in front of them. It's time to dream, man. What do you want God to do for you? How are you gonna put your imprint on this world? How is humanity gonna be different in the kingdom because you were born? What is it that you're after? What is it? And you see this, this almost, here's your sandbox. What do you want God to do? And, and it, we love that, right? You, you just, you're so addicted to, let's just see a fresh start. But at some point along the way, all these dreams now get filled with this earthly realm, and somehow we get locked into what life is telling you you're here for. We weren't birthed to just come out, and then we're in a box, and then we die, and we're in a box, and then what was life really about anyway? I can tell you if I die today, if I die on my way to L.A. after this meeting, I live with no regrets. There's nothing. I maximize this carnal. This thing went around the world and back, baby. I tell you, I beat my body to submission. I went without sleep all the time. There's nothing more I could have physically done with a life. I promise you. I did everything. It's all being happened. There's no regrets in my life. People think we're crazy because I've only been given one life. I can't take last year back, and I'm getting older on this scale. Maybe not the half of y'all up in here, but I'm getting older on the scale, and I have to redeem the time because the days are evil. But we work, man. We're attached. And then we retire. But we tell ourselves in our 30s and 40s, oh, one day, one day, you know, uh -huh. we find ourselves and we get retired, and we got a house paid off, and money, which really means nothing. I mean, who cares? And all these things that you consider your security because you've trusted someone else. And then what? One day, one day I'm really going to go on a mission trip, Pastor Mark. I'm going to be radical. I'm going to preach these things. I'm going to do And all of a sudden you retire and your knee's bad and arthritis crippled your body and you got diabetes and you can't walk and now you're just home and you're on AARP. You laugh, man. This is the sick reality some people be living in. And all of a sudden, you what? Well, I really wanted to go on a trip, but my money's low now. I really want all my income got cut down. It's never going to be convenient for you to lay down your flesh and live 100% for the kingdom. It's never going to be. If you don't do it now, you're not going to do it then. But if you would all of a sudden want to do it on the judgment seat, why aren't you doing it now? We're so attached. Friends, we're so attached. This world speaks louder. We only get you for a few hours on a Sunday morning. How in the world is that going to make a difference? Even if you're really radical and you came to the Revelation class on Friday, which you should have been here for, what is four hours going to do? Four hours isn't going to all of a sudden make you believe unless you're ready for something. And you realize that this world has nothing for you. Nothing. There's nothing. Nothing in this earth can help you. 
Your spouse isn't even going to bring you the peace that you're desiring. Your children, when you're done taking care of them, who, you got to look at yourself. I travel the world. Young people come up to me. They're like, oh, man, I want you. I want the message. I'm going to just leave everything. Oh, I can name you time and time again. Hundreds of stories that would last the rest of the day. People at 21 years old working six-figure jobs at major car. They leave everything. Come on. And they come to Connecticut. A lot of them do better than they were before. A lot of them all of a sudden have to deal with themselves. And they find themselves in a place where they're like, oh, gosh. What am I doing? They're challenged. They're exposed. They're naked spiritually, so to speak. And now they realize that they have issues. And I get young people that come years later and they say, I, I got to go. I, I just need to leave. I just need to go back. I don't know what I need to do. And I told this one young man recently, I said, here's the problem. You can leave here and you can go back to whatever you think is going to make you secure. But at the end of the day, everywhere you go, there you are. You can leave me, you can leave the word of God, you can even try to ignore the voice of the Holy Ghost, but you can't escape yourself. So as long as you have to wake up and look at yourself, then you better deal with that thing and receive the fullness of Christ in your life in real salvation, if we're to be very honest. And let it change you the way it was supposed to. The salvation was never meant to just be an agreement that somehow you default on every other day. It was really salvation, deliverance, and healing at the moment of decision. So that's what sozo means. It's such a far off concept of what we believe we're in by. Mm -hmm. And we live in a day where if the enemy can water down a message, tell you you can live any which way you want, somehow it's going to make us all happy in California. But at the end of the day, Jesus said narrow was the way that leads to, to eternal life and broad was the road, which most of California is running down, which leads to destruction. So scary today. There's a cross that needed to be picked up. There's a price that needs to be paid. We don't want to see that. So if we can keep watering down the message or we can take things like grace, which is so life-changing if we understand it and somehow dilute it and urinate on the word and make it just this garbage that we're drinking to barely make us in, it's a scary day. But you mark my words, there's a time that's coming and it's not far off where faith will be demanded. I promise you. There will come a time, I don't know what it might look like, it doesn't matter. I tell the church all the time, you know, if, if the dollar goes to nothing and you all lose everything overnight and some rare dirt in India becomes valuable, then just come see me because I'll give you all the rare Indian dirt that you would ever want. Has nothing to do with the fact that I carry rare Indian dirt, ladies and gentlemen. I just know how to get it. See, I realize that you can't wait to live by faith when that day comes. There will come a day, you mark my words, I've seen it in visions, doors will be locked from beautiful grand churches that overpromised and underdelivered. People will wise, rise up overnight and stop drinking the Kool-Aid because they're not getting free. Right. And they'll realize in a moment of crisis, I lived this, friends. We saw a glimpse of it in 2008. All of a sudden, God started doing miracles on different areas of the planet and all... Every single person we knew wanted a healing. I couldn't believe it. Every denomination, I didn't even know half these denominations believed in it. Everybody, our email boxes were flooded, invitations from around the world just because of miracles. Miracles, literally healings. And the faith level of the body of Christ went from, oh my gosh, this is real. I want this. But if we live in a realm that demands faith and it demands that we live with the things that you heard in this house... There's not going to be enough room to hold the hearers because they're going to want truth. They're going to want to know if this thing's real, help us get out of here. If this thing's real, then I want the fire. I want it now. I want the Holy Ghost. I wish I heard the messages. Can we get online? Can I go back and listen? I want the fire. I want, I want faith. I want to know how to overcome in this earth. Romans says that we're called to reign in life. How do I do that? How do I tap into another dimension? That is going to be, and right now I might not see much, but you watch. It's going to change completely on this land. Because the enemy's not going to have the final say. It ain't going to happen. He might be able to dumb up and close up some believers at the moment. But it's only temporary, friends. I promise you. The day is coming and it's slowly approaching where nothing else is going to matter but the full gospel. And those that are preaching the full gospel. Which seems like a rare breed now. 
People would rather have an hour service. They don't want tongues. They don't want all the things that this church stands for. It's going to change. Good services are going to continue to bound California up. It doesn't need any more. Great flashy looking buildings and men with cunning wisdom is going to kill this land. The only thing that has ever mattered is an awakening. And we're standing, can you imagine Amy Simple McPherson turning people away because of miracles? Can you imagine these major revivalists and movements that have come out of this land all about the power of God somehow denying it? It sounds foreign because you're in this church, but I'm telling you it's a struggle in, in mainland Christianity. And in, in that process of life and learning to live from the throne and learning to honor everything, we've got to be careful that we're not attached to the things of this world, nor do we lose the ability to dream with God. How many people have I witnessed in my life? I haven't forgotten kings. That's all tied in. How many people have I witnessed in life? God gives you a promise. He gives you a word. He gives you a dream. You were at the altar. He gave you a glimpse. He gave you a hope. You're going to be a missionary. There's going to be souls, signs and wonders, teaching Bible classes, whatever it is. And somehow along the way, he just siphons out that dream. And we begin to doubt the word was even true. It's like Jesus being baptized and the heavens open and Father says, this is my son. Immediately he's pulled into the wilderness and the enemy goes, if you're really the son. See, it's identity. He's trying to question who you really are. And if he gets you to wonder, then you've lost it. And can he get you to question the word he originally spoke? See, he told them, don't eat of this tree, friends, and that's what they did. And the enemy came to them in Genesis and said, are you sure it was this tree? See, if he can get you to question your identity, you might have to listen to this again because I'm firing off many different sermons. If he can get you to question your identity like he did with Jesus as the son, and he can get you like Genesis to wonder what was the word, then he got you stale. See, the, the, the angel said, do not eat of the tree of, of, of good and evil or whatever it was. And the enemy comes right away and says, are you sure it was this tree? Right. And I watch believers on mass. God says, I've called you to preach to the nations. I've called you to bring awakening to a land. And believers on mass are going, what was the word? Maybe it wasn't me. Maybe it was you. And maybe it wasn't fully that. He gets you to question. Right. So all of a sudden, these radical believers that started out the race, finish it. Don't, you know, Paul said, be careful that you didn't start out in the spirit and you finish in the flesh. Yes, I'm talking to all of you this morning. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's a danger. So Elisha comes and the Lord says, I'm going to bring, I'm going to end the drought. And then he says, hide. Then he says, reveal yourself. Then there's a moment in 1 Kings 18 where the Lord, uh, Elisha begins to hear the sound of the abundance of rain. And all of a sudden in verse 41, Elisha says to Ahab, 1 Kings 18, go up, eat and drink. I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Well, thank God, because last time the Lord said it, we had to hide. But the prophet, there's a moment in time, the prophet is saying, I hear the sound, get ready. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, uh, and Elisha went up to the top of Mount Carmel. He bowed down on the ground, put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, look towards the sea. And he went. The Bible says that he said there's nothing, and seven times again he said, go again. Here's where you are, church. The hope word is God's instilling hope that things are going to change, that a drought is going to end, that what you see is not going to be anymore. And he says to the servant, I hear the sound. Well, let me tell you something. I'm pretty fired up if he says I hear the sound. It's a prophet, man. I'm like, dude, let's see this thing done. And the Bible says that Elisha sits kind of awkwardly here, and he puts his head between his knees like he's about to birth something. Whether he's in prayer, whether he's in a birth, he's expecting, he's in the birth position. So the prophet, <laughs> ha, ha, 
you think is the easy job. He's sitting there and he's saying, okay, go look. I hear the sound and uh, uh, just go look. So here the servant goes and he runs on the horizon and he looks over the sea. And, and first of all, what are we even looking for? Do we even remember rain? It's been a long time. What are you looking for? Are you looking for big black clouds? Are you looking for uh, the sound? Are you looking to get wet? Are you, what are we looking for? And can I tell you, if it was me and the prophet was there and he ducked his head and he said, go look, friends, I may not be an Olympic sprinter, but gosh, I'd be close. This, this old boy would be a gazelle overnight. Because I can you imagine being the one to see the drought end? And the prophet says, go look. I mean, I'd be hustling. I'd be like, oh, I can't wait to see what's about to happen. And oh, man, this is going to be forever changing a nation. And I run to the edge. And I look. There's nothing. Oh, is it me? Am I on the wrong horizon? And I go back. Who knows how long that walk was, but it was a walk. And I got to go back to this random prophet with his head between his knees. And I say, dude, there was nothing. And I'm out of breath. Go again! I'm going to tell you something, dude. I know I'm in California. Y'all kind of laid back, slow motion, always smiling, weird stuff like that. I'm going to just tell you something, bro. I'm going to tell you where I come from. The second time, I'd have flipped on the dude. Second time, you laugh all you want. I know some of y'all in the same boat, dude. I, me running? First of all, sweating? I run it. No, I wouldn't even have ran. Second time, I would have been like, this dude. The Lord speaks to him. The dude hides for three years. Is this another one of those jokes? Oh, I hear the sound. Da -da -da. Man, I'd be like, bro. I'm not even sure if time two, I would have just done one of these. It's exactly where you are. It's exactly where you guys are. And you come back and he, then what do I, man, you know what I would have said? Bro, get up yourself and go look. You told me this thing's going to end. You send me running to the hill. I don't run. And I'm so excited. You're never as fired up as the first time. Never. You're never as excited as go. Man, you're just like, whoo, sound of the abundance of rain. This thing's going to get crazy. You laughed. That, that used to be you. You used to believe that way. You don't anymore. You used to be that way. Some of you used to just run and skip. Uh, not anymore. Second time, I'd be out, dude. I'd be like, hold on, bro. Lift up your head, dude. Let me tell you something. No, no, seriously. I'm not kidding. I'm just being honest. I said, we're done with this junk, bro. You told me the thing's ending. I went twice, bro, twice. I know what I'm looking for. I ain't blind. Get up and do it yourself. You laugh at me. Whatever. You laugh all you want. I laugh at you now. You say whatever you want to me. That's how I live, man. I said, go do it yourself. I don't know what you wanted me to look for. I went twice. You said it was going to end. You, you're the prophet, man. You, I'm the servant. You said the Lord spoke to you. There's nothing. Do you realize that it's the exact opposite of what you said? That's time two, dude. Right. To be very honest with you, some of you stop looking. Yeah, it's true. It's the word of the Lord. Never mind five and six. Don't even go there. <laughs> you know, you, you checked out, man. You gave up. You're in the meetings. You hear the word of the Lord. You stop looking. Seven times. So crazy. Seven times. Go and look again. It, it was so redundant that the author was just like, and then seven times. <laughs> Hold on, bro. You don't, no, dude. Seven times of what? Me running back and forth like a donkey? I'm the stupid one, bro. I'm dumb. I'm the dumb one in New England. Going, oh, the rain's going to end. You're the stupid one in San Diego. Oh, revival's coming. 
Bro, you're living on a dream, it seems. Seven times, man. We're believing for a drought to end. We're believing for the rain of heaven to flood a land. Nobody can. Who's seeing this? It's so interesting because at times in your life when you trust God for something, you seem out of your ever-loving mind. You seem like you're following a word that doesn't even exist compared to these people. Everyone has just accepted the drought as what it is. And some think it was God and some don't know if it was him. And some just think it's their lot in life to live dry. Seven times. Seven. Seven. You, lo- you checked out at four. You checked out at two. This is what hope is. The, the Lord comes and says, here's your destiny. Here's your dream. It's a greater purpose than what you think. I'm going to seed you with it. Oh, if he could take that out. If he can get you to stop looking on that horizon. Seven times he goes, go again. He goes. See, you know what tells me that the servant didn't lose hope? Because he saw it. He finally goes on time seven. Was it any different? Did he run any harder? Who even knows? I don't know if I would have lasted seven. Friends, I'm mildly burnt out preaching right now. I need a snack. He runs seven times, dude. And on the seventh time, he runs to the horizon. What is he even looking for? If he's listening to the enemy that's tormenting most of y'all, then he's just like, it ain't going to happen. You're clueless. What are you even doing? You know, this ain't really going to happen. And you're just busy with your own affairs. And he looks on the horizon. Six times, nothing. No rain. It's a drought. And he sees a cloud rising off the horizon. The size of a man's hand. I have some big sausage fingers. If I cut my hand off and pasted it on this ceiling, you probably wouldn't find it. You probably say, what is this? Have you been to the horizon? Have you looked on an ocean? You couldn't find a cloud that size. And he sees it. And he goes, there it is. See, Psalm says, the satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb. But to the hungry ones, every bitter thing becomes sweet. When you're hungry, you don't need that much convincing. When you're looking for something, you're going to find it. Oh, this is really good preaching. Oh, this is phenomenal preaching. You're getting the best this morning. And ironically, he's quoting this verse that many of you probably never heard. <laughs> to, the, to the hungry ones, to those that are looking, they'll find it. See, if you're looking for it, you don't need much convincing. But when you're satisfied, even the sweet things are bitter to you because you're just full of yourself. But to the hungry ones, oh, I don't load the honeycomb. Every single bitter thing, let it be sweet. I'm looking, I'm looking on the, I'm looking. He sees the cloud, he runs back to the prophet. The prophet says, there it is. Let's get the chariots and gird up because it's about to be a flood. The Lord is going to answer now. It was a cloud this big. Seven times. Not losing hope. If he was looking at the way most of our lenses are, he wouldn't have saw that. You only see the cloud when you're looking for it. You want to know the word of the Lord for you this morning? Here it is. You better learn to live with a cloudless sky. God is looking for those in San Diego that will live with a sky without clouds. Learn to live with a cloudless sky. You might seem crazy, but it's coming. It might seem out of your mind, but it's going to arise any moment. But you learn to live. I'm in New England. God help me. I'm living in a cloudless sky. I'm in a land that nobody even comes to. Nobody's looking at. But I see it. I'm looking on the horizon. It doesn't matter how many times. His word is true. But if the enemy can steal that hope, then he has your mind off of looking for the promise. Living with a cloudless sky every day, believing his word, knowing that you're out your ever-loving mind, but you're supposed to be. But the truth is when the cloud rises, 
Oh, it's just like the return of the Lord. He's coming for those that are looking for him. Who is looking for him? Who is in this land that is saying, God, give me the cloud. My eyes are off of what the needs are on this earth. My eyes are off the lack of finances. My eyes are off the job and all these things. And my kids are growing horns and all these weird men. My husband's breath is bad and the dog has rabies. At the end of the day, I'm looking at a, cloud, a skyless cloud. I'm looking at a horizon that you can't see. You think I'm crazy because I'm standing on the edge of a cliff saying it's coming. Oh, friends. It came. The drought ended in the drought on this land, on this physical land, on the land of this country in California is going to end. This, this land that you're sitting on right now was not meant to just sit here. It was meant for the purposes of God. But you know what he's looking for? People that will look for that. They're looking on this property saying this was meant to be an apostolic center. This was meant to be a training center for the nations. This was meant to broadcast to the world the goodness of God. And we're not, I don't care what you see right now because we see something different. And something happens when God restores hope that you begin to look again. That you begin to not, oh, friends, this earth means nothing. Oh, the opinions of unbelieving Christians mean nothing. It doesn't matter anymore. You can't even penetrate that realm when you're seated in another dimension. It doesn't matter. The words don't matter. The earth that just continually groans at you doesn't matter because we're looking at something else. Our eyes are focused on a horizon in San Diego saying, come on. My destiny is locked up in this drought ending. My purpose is locked up that, that we operate. See, it, it's this beautiful parable of the now and the not yet that we live in everything now because he's given it to us now. We activate faith now, but we're not stupid. This is not the fullness yet of what we're going to see crash a land. So there's still the not yet of God bring the rain. See, it's individually we get awakened and then corporately God can awaken us and then, oh. Man, what could happen? Right. But can we live with a cloudless sky seven times and not lose hope? Yeah. A day, who knows? But we're locked for something different. We're girded for another dimension. Right. Jesus taught as one having authority, not as the scribes something different about those people when they open their mouth things shift when your pastor speaks it thunders in you because of the authority of god when you you understand what i'm saying we live in a really feeble day where everybody's a legend in their own mind and here's facebook and a 50 year old homeless guy could be in his box and is at his mom's house and says whatever he wants to try to fool you and because the discernment level is so low among believers today you just buy into any whipping lie you want not going to fool those that are true. Let me hear you talk. Let me look in your eyes and see who you've been with. Right. See, we live in a day where everybody wants to be an echo. Nobody's a voice anymore. We live in a day where everybody's just all one-liners to fool half the less discerning population. But there's still a remnant. There's still a remnant that longs for the fighter and the authority of God to be established. That aren't going to be bought out by statuses and things that don't ever matter and the things in this world that will never produce right. because faith is the only thing that can produce and when faith is activated you see clouds rise when, when you look beyond dead words and clanging symbols and things that don't matter faith is all that God is looking for and when faith is established this earth can be shaken when faith is established then clouds rise out of the sky and droughts end because men are looking for it Seven times, and he didn't lose heart. There's something about hope being established. And I'm here to tell you this morning that whether you're on four, five, six, two, whether you checked out at one, it doesn't matter. There's a cloud that's going to rise in your horizon. There's a drought that's going to end in your life. There's a reason you're alive. There's a greater purpose you've been called to. What is that? What is it in our life that we're locking on to? Timothy says those that are on the front lines of battle don't consume themselves with the affairs of this world. This world doesn't matter when you're focused on the kingdom. It doesn't even make a difference anymore. The things that all these Christians around me hold value in means nothing. 
It's not about reputation. It's not about seeming cool anymore. Those things don't even matter. I don't care if you think I'm cool on the judgment seat. I'm in with crowns and souls and things that are eternal. And I know if that day would come, Lord, hold it off in my life. But if that day would come, there will be thousands and millions of people that would stand in that line and say, I'm different because you were sent to earth. My life has changed because you were born. There's, think about all the masses of millions that will look to this beautiful pastor and say, gosh, my life, I'd be in that line. My life's been changed because you believed and you dared to dream and you constantly lived above the realm of mediocrity. Are you with me? Jesus said, if I cast out a, a, a demon by the finger of God, then the kingdom of heaven come upon you. The finger of God could make the... See, every time there's a miracle, every time you in this worship atmosphere, which just, just undoes you in this place, when you're in this, uh, the, the kingdom tries to come upon you. Every time the word's preached, every time the fire falls, every time the kingdom is just longing to come upon you in greater measure, we've got to say yes to that. We've got to say, Lord, I, I'm not going to leave here the same today. I'm going to have faith and hope awaken in my life. I'm going to see the heartbeat of heaven reestablished in my beliefs. Yes. If we can have somebody come up. I don't know if you can hold the baby and play. Let's see how good you are. But I truly believe that. God is going to reestablish faith. It's hope. It's the dream that God gave you. You're here clearly this morning because you believe. I mean, you wouldn't be around this kind of fire if you didn't have a belief. But I'm, I'm so done seeing a few people that I can look up to on earth. I'm so finished with one or two believing people. It's time the saints rise. It's time the body becomes the body, you know. I... I actually just brought a lot of books, and I can probably sell them in the hall. I don't have them out, so remind me, Deb. But I opened my book with, I remember I'm in a small church. We've planted a bunch, but I was like 18 in the inner city, and the sound man. This is the most packed out sound booth I've ever seen, by the way. Y'all were running like 20 deep during worship. It's like the Simpsons couch. But I'm, I'm in worship, and the sound man who this. Lord speaks to the sound guys, dude. And he comes down to the front and he says, Pastor, I have a vision in the meeting. And I said, I'm about to do transition. So I'm like, okay, what is it? And he goes, I just see Jesus' head bouncing and floating around the room. I thought, oh, here we go. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. So I said, okay. I said, all right, bro. I said, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Praise the Lord. You know, I'm grabbing my mic. And the guy comes back and he goes, no, 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 Pastor. Do you want to know what he said? I said, yes, John. Tell me what the bouncing, floating head of Jesus said, please. Just picture this weird head, you know, with a beard. And... I said, tell me what the bouncing, floating head of Jesus said. He said, he only said one thing. I want my body back. I want my body back. And at that moment, I realized, I realized that we're it. It's the man on the street that he had a withered arm in, in our city from Puerto Rico. You know, he said he was trying to get a coconut down and a machete cut him and his arm was all withered. And, you know, we were ministering on the streets and they were all fishing and they were Spanish speaking. And I remember looking at him and, and uh, just wanting to pray for him. And my mom's crippled in her hands, and she would hide her hands often from embarrassment. I didn't have a word of knowledge. Sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks to you based on what you know, and his hand was hidden. And I said, what's wrong with your arm? And he shows me his withered arm. And I said, Jesus can set you free and heal you from this accident. And would you mind if I prayed for you, friends, tens and tens of thousands? No one has ever said no. They have nothing to lose but their sickness. And he said, sure. And at that moment, I said, okay, I want to pray for your arm. And, and I went to lay hands on him. And oh, my goodness, man, every single person from the pier comes out. And there's hundreds of people gathered around me. And I'm like, oh, my Lord, what is happening? And I'm like, Father! Oh, Lord, I just thank you for healing. Amen. Oh, oh, man, you don't feel any better. I love you. Bless you. Here's the gospel. Let me pray for you. Let me move on. 
And we're on to the next person in the streets that we wanted to pray for. And the Holy Spirit said, pray for that man. And I said, oh, contraire, mon frere. You saw what I just did. See, my conscience went clean, but there was no faith. And the Lord said, go back and pray for that man. I said, I can't, man. And so just to, just to compliment my flesh, I said to my friends, hey, I think I need to go pray for the dude. And they're like, you already did. Let's go pray for others. There's more waiting for the Lord. I said, you're right. My conscience was clean, man. Come on. Half of y'all don't even pray for people that are sick in the streets. Get out of here. And the Lord said, you better go pray for that man. I said, oh, really, bro? I said, dudes, hold on, man. I need to have a talk with this guy. I said, what are you talking about? Go pray for the man. I literally walked away, had this, like, a conversation with the Lord. I'm like, you want me to go pray for him? Do you realize there's nobody else on this pier that's believing you like this? I'm probably the only dude that's stretching out to believe, and you're telling me to go back again, make myself look stupid. I tried to pray. All these people got up. I'm being honest with the Lord. I'm like, come on, man. And I'm just so frustrated because all I hear is go pray for this man. Go pray for this man. I just did. And finally, in the moment of frustration, you know, I'm a new believer, and finally I just say, you know what? If you want to heal him, then why don't you come do it yourself? And all of a sudden, the father says, I just tried, but you wouldn't let me. And I realized at that moment, he doesn't have any other hands but yours. He doesn't have any other mouths but yours. That's why he lives in us. And I went back to my friends and I said, y'all going to shut up right now. I'm going to tell you what we're doing. I'm going back to that dude. I'm going to pray for him. You can come or not. It doesn't matter. The father told me to go back. And I went back to this dude. I said, Poppy, let's talk. I said, and then I, didn't, I needed an interpreter, right? They're fishing. As his boy could speak English. So I said, here's what I want you to tell him. I want you to tell him the truth. I wanted to pray for him. And people came around. And I got fearful. And I didn't pray a prayer of faith. And the Holy Spirit told me to come back to pray for you. And I'm going to be very honest. If Jesus Christ was standing here in front of him, his arm would have grew out. I don't buy into some false theology that Jesus ever tried and couldn't. Never. Everyone he prayed for was healed. Everybody touched him was made whole. Do people stand far off today in unbelief and don't get healed? Of course. But don't build a doctrine that he tried and couldn't. And I said, can I get another shot, man? Let me pray one more time for you. And he said, please. Friends, I'm going to tell you, you could put a microphone in my hand. You could have built a stage, put the big screens like Reinhardt. It wouldn't have mattered at that point. It was done. I knew in my heart that I had to live beyond just a clean conscience and step into the realm of faith. And I stood in front of that dude and I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I curse this accident. I break these devils off his life. And I, I grabbed his little nub and I said, no! The dude screams. And I'm like, oh, Lord, did I just like rip the thing? <laughs> and right in front of my eyes, God stretches his arms out, heals all the scars, completely restores his arm. And he's 100% healed on that pier in front of everybody. It's all that Jesus knows how to do. Even six months ago, I'm driving in my Jeep, and I look and I see this dude far off waving at me with his arm. We went into his house, did a bob, but what was the point? I made a decision that I wasn't going to live in a conscious, cleaned environment to fool yourself with your own blindness. But I was going to step over into a place of faith and believe again every promise, everything he's called us to do on this earth. And despite, I don't care who watches, who mimics, who mocks, it doesn't matter to me. When I stand on that day, it's not going to matter, did they all get healed? Did I give him an opportunity to do what he died for? Did I spend this life my life has had more setbacks than you could ever imagine. My life. 
being on drugs and having a kid at 15, on heroin at 14, never having a father in my life, never graduating high school, every single reason in my life, getting married at 16, horrible things in my past, everything in my life set me up to not do what I'm doing. Do I just hold other people? Do I blame others? Do I blame my mom? The fact that there was no dad, no education, all the church telling me I wasn't qualified. How many, how many things do you need before you start to believe lies? Or do I realize that I can't control what happened then? But from this morning forward, you can change. That in a moment, it's one mindset to say, I'm, I'm a kingdom dweller now. Doesn't matter. The enemy can mock all he wanted. He did it at the cross. It doesn't matter to me. This life will be used for the supernatural. This life will be used for the realm of faith. That's all I was born on this earth for. That's all that you were created for. This earth doesn't matter. This realm you live in doesn't make sense. All that matters is the kingdom. Opening our eyes to where we're seated. Living from another dimension. Learning to live the throne room life. Let's stand to your feet this morning, friends. Here's what I want to do. I feel like there's people here this morning. And I want to pray for you. You may feel like there's been hopelessness inserted. You may feel like there was a dream in your heart. I don't need you to bow your head. I'm talking to big kids this morning. God, there's an anointing here this morning to break that barrenness. There's an anointing here this morning to erase that lie. Whatever that is, all a lie is is you, you've just unbelieved the truth. It's, it's a belief that you had that unbelief twisted it and lied to you about the truth. But whatever it is in your life that God has positioned that and the enemy tried to take it, I want to pray for you. Because there's an anointing of hope this morning. There's an injection of faith to begin to believe again. There's an injection of faith to begin to say, God, I'm a water walker. I'm birthed for the supernatural. It's not enough to hear it from a good preacher every single week, which half of you take for granted. But I got to believe it in myself. See, Peter and John were walking on that gate called Beautiful. And a man asked for money. And you know the story. They didn't have the cash. But when I give to you in the name of Jesus, blah, 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 he rises up, causes great controversy and persecution, but here's what was a perfect about that situation. It was the first time you saw a miracle since Jesus died. Oh, so there comes a moment in life where they're walking along that road and here's the beggar and what do we do now? He's not here anymore. He's not over here to do it for us. Pastor Mark's not here to preach a great message or to lay hands. And all of a sudden, you have to answer the question, will it work for me? Can I activate this in this lame man when no one else around? Pastor Mark's not here to preach the kingdom down. No one else is here to do it. Jesus is in. What am I going to do? And they made the choice. Let's call on his name. And it's the first time recorded anyway that you see it. The next generation go, I'm going to see if it works for me. Yeah. Silver and gold I don't have. Come on, most of y'all just give them a buck. Get out of here. Silver and gold I don't have. But what I have, oh, 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 he gave it to me. I know it's on the inside of me. I know I've been equipped with this. I'm only going to give you what I have. Paul said what I received from the Lord I passed on to you. We can't give what we don't have. I know what I've been given in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Wow. And there's that aha moment that needs to happen in your life. Towards not amening amazing preaching and deep revelation and word. It's you saying, okay, God wants to equip me. And you're preparing to have, you're fitting to have months of some amazing speakers coming through here. And God is giving you a window to just get something. And you need to make a choice now. You don't need to wait for the next preacher or next Sunday or Friday night. You need now to say, you know what, God, I'm going to take that place out. Sing, oh, barren woman. The area that seems so insignificant in your life, the area that seems so out of touch is the actual place that it's going to be filled. More are the children of the desolate woman than those that have kids. Barren women don't want to sing. And barren believers don't want prayer. But I'm telling you this morning. God wants to touch you. He wants to inject faith in your life this morning. So if that's you, we're going to begin to worship. Come on, my friend. And if that's you, I want you to come forward this morning. I want to pray for you. Oh, this ain't time to look cute, friend. Eternity is in the distance. God wants to inject you with faith this morning. <laughs> Lord, help me. Let's move some chairs. Angels are going to be busy. 
I believe faith is going to be established this morning. The fire of faith is going to burn in you. There's a purpose. Come on. Let's just let it rise. Come on. Let's just go.